I've got more bad news. Have I made an impression yet? Food. Global wheat per, per, um, provides 20% of all human protein on this planet. But with rising CO2 content in the air, wheat is less nutritious. It has less iron, and the protein in that wheat offers um, less strong uh, protein. It's weaker protein. So the nutrient value of wheat declines as our CO2 um, content in the atmosphere increases. With human population growth by 2050, the demand for wheat is going to increase 60%, but the ability of wheat to provide that is going to decline by 15%. Wheat yields will decline by 15%. Maize, rice, and soybean, the four of them, wheat, maize, rice, and soybean make up the 80% uh, of the protein source for the human population. They're all suffering under climate change. Climate change could kill more than a half million people uh, by 2050 worldwide just due to changes in diets and body weight from reduced crop productivity. You get fewer calories. Food prices are already projected to double by 2030, and that points to the very important role of local food production. We need to produce our own food more and more. Here we have calories per person in various geographic areas, Southeast Asia, Europe, the Middle East. With no climate change in green and climate change in purple, every one of these areas sees a decline in calories per person because of restricted food production. And here we have the foods and increase in world market export prices. So the price of food each one of these foods, with no climate change in green and climate change in purple, you see an increase in the price of all these foods. Even as, they be, as we are able to produce fewer of them and they're less nutritious, they will go up in cost. This is the current per capita calories averaged for each of those populations, and then how will it change under climate change projections in the future? So it's like current food choices. Yes, current food choices, current uh, caloric intake. Yep. Is there a law in Hawaii to stop, um, to just stop the fishing, to, to, to stop the um, fishing for fish that helps the coral? The fishing issue is very complex. Um, the state has a Department of Land and Natural Resources that gathers data on fishing. There are questions whether the data that any agency collects actually reflects the amount of fishing going on. But there are certain types of fish that uh, the data indicate are being sustainably collected, sustainably fished. And there are other types of fish which are not being sustainably fished. Parrotfish are down to 6% of their natural size in many reefs around Hawaii. And parrotfish are a very important species because they crop back algae. And parrotfish are really easy to hunt. It turns out at nighttime, they lie down and go to bed. They surround themselves with a bubble, and all you have to do is find them and then spear them. It's not even hunting, hunting it's really gathering. You can go out and gather parrotfish. So um, we're still trying to get on top of how do we sustainably manage our fishing issues. Yes? Sidebar, the Kauai area, the sea urchin bloom is really gone up high. Population density has gone up, but the shell, the test of the urchin itself is getting weaker. So there's a sea, sea urchin bloom in the Kauai High area. The bloom is increasing, but the shells themselves are weak and fragile. That would be due to ocean acidification. That's interesting. So our forests are scaled and evolved into this, um, this uh, development of clouds in our upper watersheds. In fact, it's been estimated between one third and one half of the water that enters the ground and goes to our groundwater systems, which is where we get our drinking water, comes from fog drip. So our forests are actually collecting water droplets and then dripping it into the ground. They, those species and that diversity of the forest has, uh, plays a very important role uh, in providing us with fresh water and as invasive species 
uh, attack that forest. Uh, and as climate change attacks that forest, we see the diversity and the makeup of species in our, in our upper forests changing. So the, the question is, does reforestation lead to cloud preservation or more cloud generation? And I don't know that we know the answer to that. But we do know that reforestation and eliminating invasive species is valuable just because these forests are the best water gatherers that we, that we could have. I'll spend the rest of the time on sea level rise, which is my particular area of research. Um, but I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, sea level rise around the world is a result of warming the ocean so that they expand, um, melting glaciers in the mountains, and melting Greenland and Antarctica. Today, sea level, the average sea level rise around the world is three times faster than in the 20th century. So we've seen an acceleration in the global rate of sea level rise. Here we are in the early 20th century. Our best estimate is sea level was rising at about three inches per century. Then it accelerated. It doubled by mid-century. It doubled again by the end of the century. And now it's up two and a half feet of sea level rise, two and a half feet of sea level rise per century now we're up to. And this just came out at the, at the end of last week. So we're clearly on our way to three feet of sea level rise, which used to be considered an extreme outer estimate, but we'll get into that in a minute. This is the mass of Greenland in billions of tons. And it begins in 2002, it goes to 2016, 2017, and we have a satellite every 10 days that measures the gravity field over Greenland. And as Greenland melts, the gravity field gets smaller. And this is a very sensitive satellite. You can see the snowfall in this winter, summer melt, winter snow, summer melt, winter snow. And you can see the long-term decline in the amount of ice on Greenland. And this is 281 billion tons of ice per year being lost from Greenland. Most of the melting in Greenland is taking place in the coastline, and it's migrating upward at 40 meters in elevation per year. In blue, up in the plateau, is where there's still more snowfall than there is melting. But as you saw from the previous slide, overall the bank account is in deficit, even though there's still net snow accumulation up in the plateau. In seven years, by 2025, there's a 50% probability that this red boundary will completely cover the southern plateau of Greenland, at which point the probability of melting exceeds the probability of snow accumulation. And that may be a tipping point at which southern Greenland um, starts an unstoppable melt, unstoppable retreat. Antarctica is losing about half the amount of ice, 118 billion tons of ice per year. It's a much noisier system, but you can see strong downward decline in the amount of ice. East Antarctica is that giant plateau. It's still relatively stable. West Antarctica is this area. There are a number of ice sheets here. The Pine Island ice sheet and the Thwaites ice sheet have now been considered irreversibly retreating. So we have passed a tipping point in these major ice sheets in West Antarctica. The reason is that these ice sheets go back into retrograde water-filled valleys. And more than half the melting taking place, taking place is from warm water underneath. And so as cold, fresh water streams off of Antarctica, it floats on the ocean, fresh water floats on salt water, and traps an inversion underneath of warm salt water. Salt melts ice, and so does warm water, so the temperature of the ice is raised about 4 degrees C, and that moves it past its melting point, so this warm, salty water is melting from underneath. 
This is called stratification of the ocean with this cold water on top, uh, layering and trapping this hot water underneath. These are the world's alpine glaciers taken all together. You see strong decline also from that same satellite, the GRACE satellite, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment is what GRACE stands for. And here is the heat content of the ocean from the early 20th century for the deepest ocean, the intermediate ocean, and the shallow ocean. And you can see strong acceleration of heat content in the ocean such that the oceans absorb heat at twice the rate they did just in the 1990s. Our oceans are absorbing heat faster and faster and expanding. All of this has been attempted to be modeled by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which comes out report with reports. The last one was in 2013, 2014, projecting the future of sea level rise so that we have some basis for planning future sea level rise. And in 2013, their estimate was half a foot by 2030, one foot by mid-century, two feet and three feet by the end of the century. And that's the worst case scenario of burning greenhouse gases without slowing down. And it's the outer edge of that error envelope. So this is the worst case of the worst case scenario and we've been using these sea level scenarios for modeling the impacts of sea level rise on Oahu, Kauai, and Maui. I'll show you some results in a little bit. So three feet of sea level rise by the end of the century was considered the worst case scenario, and that's what you want to model if you're building elevated rail or huge condominium towers. You know, if you have a large construction project, you want to plan for the low probability but very dangerous potential event. However, since 2013, we've discovered that ice is melting more rapidly than expected. And a whole series of papers have come out talking about the rate of melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. In this paper, Pine Island Glacier's grounding line is probably engaged in an unstable 40 kilometer retreat. This is that unstoppable melting of Pine Island Glacier. Two groups of scientists reported today based on close and constant examination Large parts of the Western Antarctica ice sheet appears to have collapsed. The area shown here in red, scientists say further degradation is almost certainly unstoppable. They say global warming is accelerating the pace of disintegration. NASA's lead polar ice researcher said, quote, this is really happening. There's nothing to stop it now. These scientists say the ice sheet can add 13 feet to global sea levels slowly at first and over the next 100 years or so. By the way, um, a paper came out a couple of weeks ago documenting that the world's oceans have lost 2% of their dissolved oxygen. So the oceans are becoming, um, they're losing dissolved oxygen and that's because as the shallow water of the oceans warms, it floats more, it's more buoyant. And so winds can't mix the ocean as much, can't get air into the ocean and under this buoyant shallow layer, you have organic decay with all the plankton that go through their lifestyle and that absorbs oxygen out of the water column. So the oceans are, are heading towards anoxia very slowly. In January of this year, NOAA came out with a report. In fact, it was published on January 20th, inauguration day. I, I know those guys, I know they were working fervently to get that report done. <laughs> because now they're being demoted and moved over to different, uh, different jobs. And they proposed six future scenarios of sea level rise and their intermediate scenario is three feet by the end of the century. So we've gone from the worst case to an intermediate scenario by the end of the century. And their intermediate high is five feet and then six and a half feet is their high scenario and an extreme scenario is eight and a half feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And in a cruel twist of physics, it turns out that when you melt the Greenland ice sheet, as the gravity of the ice sheet goes away, the fact that water was attracted to that gravity 
goes away. And so water flows elsewhere away from the Greenland ice sheet. So you get sea level fall around the Greenland ice sheet as it melts. And other places on the planet have to make up for that with higher than average sea level rise. And Hawaii sits right in the middle of the darkest red area for Greenland ice sheet melting, West Antarctic ice sheet melting, East Antarctic ice sheet melting, and Alpine ice sheet melting. So Hawaii and other tropical Pacific locations will see 25% more sea level rise than the global average, the global mean. So most of us think that sea level rise comes like that. It comes over the shoreline. But in fact, potentially more damaging and occurring sooner is the fact that the water table will come up. Because if you study the water table, it turns out it goes up and down with the tides. And as you're closer to the ocean, it tracks almost one for one for the marine tide. And as you come further back from the ocean, it goes down to 60% and then 50 and 30% of the marine tide. And the timing gets offset. High tide in the water table back here may occur an hour after high tide in the ocean. But the fact that it goes up and down with the tides means that the water table is attached to the ocean. It is experiencing ocean dynamics. So as the ocean rises with global warming, the water table will rise with global warming. And when the water table reaches the land surface, it's an environment known as a wetland. So we will have these wetlands. First, they'll happen at the highest tide of the year, and then go away. Then the highest tide of the month, and then it'll go away. And then twice a month. And then every day at high tide, and then pretty soon, permanent, permanent wetlands taking place. I have friends in Florida that have ponds that appear and disappear in their backyard because it's tied to the tides and it's the groundwater table. In addition, as I explained earlier, you can get salt water coming up through our storm drains. And this is Waikiki. There's a little ring of sand there. That's where waves that spit out of this drainage pipe are, are actually depositing sand. And then there's salt water flowing down the gutter, if you see that mirror there, that's salt water flowing away from the camera. So this is high tide. This is called nuisance flooding. And you've heard about king tides. This is one of the things we see happening at king tides. Here is, if you excavate in Waikiki, that's the water table at high tide. It's only two feet below the ground surface. And that two feet was put there prior to World War II, when we excavated the Alawai and the Kualo Basin and um, Ala Moana swim area, all that dredge was put down in Kaka'ako and in Waikiki, and we raised the land level two feet. And otherwise, it would be wet now. And when it rains at high tide, the rainwater has nowhere to drain. It can't soak into the ground, and it can't go out the drainage infrastructure. So you get this flash flooding. The so drainage is what sea level rise looks like in an urban area. In yellow, you have one foot of dry soil. And in other areas that are not in color, you have more than one foot in dry, of dry soil. And in blue, you have water on the, that's my daughter, sorry, sorry honey. So this is one foot of sea level rise. You can see very narrow soil. And there's two feet of sea level rise. It, Noah's intermediate high would have this by mid-century. There's three feet of sea level rise. A lot of standing water coming out of the drainage infrastructure and from the groundwater table, and also very shallow dry soil so that when it rains, there's not much accommodation space to take up that rain. It's called the Vados zone. Four feet of sea level rise. What the hell? Five feet of sea level rise. You know, at what point do we no longer have a viable footprint in this area? And the intermediate high, not even the high scenario, the intermediate high scenario still has us this century. 
You also know that we have waves that occur every summertime from the south or in the wintertime from the north. We have seasonal waves. And at two feet of sea level rise, this is the wave flooding in Eva Beach to the west of Honolulu. It's not very dramatic unless you live in these areas. But at three feet of sea level rise, you seem to cross a tipping point. This is a typical southern swell happening every summer, and it will flood many blocks landward under three feet of sea level rise. Then there's beach erosion, right? When we erode beaches, we tend to put up seawalls to protect homes and roads, and those seawalls lead to beach, beach narrowing and beach loss. Seawalls are the death of beaches, and beaches are important not only for us, but for monk seals and turtles. And we've modeled this process. It turns out that if erosion is within 20 feet of a building, you qualify for an emergency permit from Department of Land and Natural Resources. So we have an erosion model, and this is Sunset, and it turns out that today, 18 homes on Sunset Beach fall within 20 feet of erosion. They qualify for an emergency permit. That's 10% of the beachfront homes along Sunset. With just one foot of sea level rise, that jumps to 109 buildings, and we have 60% of the shoreline qualifying for emergency permitting. Emergency permitting is what you would need to have if you want to build a seawall. It doesn't mean that DLNR will give them a seawall, but it means these people are in a world of hurt. They're freaking out. These homeowners want to do something. So we need an exit strategy for these homeowners besides building seawalls if we want beaches for our grandkids and for our monk seals. So here's Eva Beach. Red is the erosion under three feet of sea level rise. Blue is the wave flooding every year under three feet of sea level rise. And green is the groundwater and storm drain flooding under three feet of sea level rise. There's Waikiki. You can see a lot of flooding. The Alawai flows over its banks under three feet of sea level rise. A lot of standing water. Here's Punalu'u, if you've ever driven up the windward side of Oahu. You know there are communities all up and down the windward side. A combination of groundwater flooding and wave flooding. And here's my last slide. You made it. The Dutch say that if you wage war with water, you will lose. Yield and elevate. And this is an architectural uh, vision after Hurricane Sandy hit Long Island, the idea is to sculpt the land into ridges and swales, create purposely floodable walkways and roads with a French drain running down the middle, raise all year development up on very robust post and pier construction, don't have any external features that could be ripped off in high winds, have localized food and manufacturing, have walkable communities, have people living on the second and third floors above a business district on the first floor. It's called smart growth. And in fact, in the background is a raised road. So I'll end with that and take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you very much. You had a question. Is that right? You learned a great lesson then. Yes. Hurricane Sandy was not the most powerful storm, but it was the largest storm uh, in, I think, the, the history of the Atlantic. Typical hurricane is 500 miles wide. That one was over 1,000 miles wide. Question in the back, yeah. We learn a lot, and the situation isn't so different. We, we are paying attention. In 2014, the legislature created the interagency, excuse me,
Climate Adaptation Committee. So a committee was formed. It's now in uh, 2017 legislature has turned it into a commission. There is a Climate Adaptation Commission for the state of Hawaii. The first thing they've tackled is sea level rise. Then um, they will go on to other climate change issues. Uh, and a report will be coming out, the, coming out at the end of this academic year, looking, uh, taking those data that I showed you and assessing the economic footprint. What's the land value under that wave run up? What is the building value? How many people will be displaced? How many miles of road? So we'll see the sort of economic exposure to the sea level rise hazards. Uh, also modeling the 1% flood, which would be either tsunami or hurricanes, whatever has a 1% chance of happening in any year in a century. So that report will also propose some ideas for uh, adapting to the problem of sea level rise, and they are scouring the experiences of other cities and countries uh, to, to give a very complete list of actions that um, are being used elsewhere as also you know, creative actions that might be employed here. So look for the end of this calendar year, a big sea level rise report, which will go to the legislature and hopefully there'll be some legislation attached to it and we hope to pass some legislation to help Hawaii move into a more fl uh, adaptive fl footing for sea level rise. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe not a question, but an observation. One thing that's really influenced my thinking around adaptation is, and I read this a couple of years ago, I think, that even if we stopped all anthropogenic input into the atmosphere right now, we're still committed to a certain level of global warming over a certain time span, 100 years or whatever it was. It was a real wake up for me. Stop it all you want, but we're still committed and we've got to adapt to it. That's right. If we stopped all, the client, all greenhouse gas emissions today, we'd still experience on the order of two meters of sea level rise, but it would play out over a thousand years. If we continue burning fossil fuels as we have, it's going to play out this century. So it's a matter of you know, when do you want the worst to occur? And that's one very important reason why we try to uh, decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. The other reason is because while we might ultimately experience two meters of sea level rise, we could avoid three meters of sea level rise and four meters of sea level rise. Same, same with temperature. The climate system has a, a huge, has huge inertia. If I, and for example, if I took an ice cube and placed it right there, it would take a couple of minutes for it to melt. It's going to take Greenland a couple of centuries to melt. There's this inertia to the climate system. It's going to play out even if we stop the warming right now. In the very back of the room. Yes, you. Right. So king tide is a term that's been borrowed from the Australians. It's been used for years in Micronesia. Um, it was never really used in Hawaii until this year. I've seen it used in South Carolina and Florida in the last couple of years. So it's, been, it's slowly making its way around the world. The reason we're using it this year is because in the 100-year history of the Honolulu tide gauge, April, this past April, had the highest water levels ever recorded. So this is a king tide. It's an extreme high tide. The reason for that high water level is we're getting into the, we are in the season of the year when the highest tides occur, but also there's residual high warm water from the El Nino, and there are circulation patterns, these eddies that, are, that migrate through the Hawaiian Islands and sea level is a couple of inches higher there, and all these are happening at the same time, so there's this stacking effect. So we have the highest water levels ever measured in Hawaii. Next year, they may not be as high. But they're a good example. The water levels are six to eight inches above normal. They're a good example of, of what sea level rise will look like for low-lying areas. In Puoko, there's a brackish water pond east of the main road. These two last king tides, so-called king tides, the pond is overflowed and run in the backyard about six different houses down there. And that's the first time I've ever seen that happen. Yeah, OK. So, uh, uh, a brackish water Ankyaline pond, I guess, in Puaco has overflowed for the first time that you've seen it associated with these king tides, these extreme high tides. Typically July, late July is the highest tide of the year.
but we started seeing them earlier because of this process. In the very, yes? Thank you for that. So yeah, there is a petition. We need to get to it before tomorrow. And what was the website again? Expand. Expand. P-N-M-N. Sorry, Evening and nanometer. Yes. Right, so what should we teach our young children? Um, did a copy of my Climate Change in Hawaii book make it to the table back there? So I have a booklet, it's on the order of 20 or 30 pages, it's called Climate Change in Hawaii. And I think the basic climate system with the trade winds, um, the orographic effect and cloud formation, the trade winds come from what's known as the Hadley cell, which is a a global circulation pattern. These are easy to understand, um, easy to communicate, and there are lots of modules and experiences for engaged learning that can be generated from these. You know, go outside, what's the trade wind doing today? Measure it, give them a little anemometer that costs $25. So you can do lots of uh, data collection and observation and just get to know the modern climate system. And then a little bit later, ask, what does science know about how this is changing? and present some of the changes, and that's in this booklet. Same with the ocean. If you're down near the ocean, you know, they could make some measurements of water temperature. You can do pH very easily. And you may not see changes in the course of a school year, but you can show changes from other data sets. Um, so I think observation in the form of engaged learning, where they are learning these processes themselves, and then bring in a little bit later, you know, how are these things changing? Do not bring them to one of my lectures. <laughs> Please. Or, you know, they're gonna fill the pickup truck with beer, go to the beach and never be heard from again. It turns out that instead of recycling waste or energy saving light bulbs, we should avoid air travel, live car free, eat a plant-based diet, and have smaller families. These are the emission savings in tons of CO2 per year for having one fewer child. That's where the Japan average is and the Russian average. To live car-free to avoid one transatlantic flight, to buy green energy, increase your car's, car's fuel economy, give up an electric car, eat a plant-based diet, replace gasoline car with a hybrid car, wash your clothes in cold water, recycle, hang your dry clothes instead of using a dryer, and upgrade your light bulbs. This paper just came out, and it pours through the literature and it tells us really how we should be behaving. Um, if you email me or... What's that? The paper itself. Yeah, the paper. I have the paper. I can give you the link to the paper. Get, get in touch with me, Fletcher at soest.hawaii.edu. 
Is there another, another question in the back? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. Yep. Yep. There is some good news. Nobody asked. I've thoroughly beaten you guys down so that you don't even bother asking anymore. Um, those blue years are global CO2 emissions, and there's no slope to them. So globally, we have stopped the increase in CO2 emissions. And this is largely led by China, the United States, and the European Union. China is still increasing its CO2 emissions, but at a lower rate. Yes? Um, you may have already answered this with the graph two slides ago, but I'm thinking of that Yale, I think it was a Yale study that said around 60% of Americans do indeed believe in climate change. Is that right? The majority of Americans do, but we don't want to hear about the negative aspects and we feel disempowered. So let's pretend I'm that person. I fall into the 60% and you are in an elevator or stuck on a plane with me. <laughs> with your extensive knowledge, what would be the most important pieces in having a conversation with me? So what I try to, what I try to do is talk about the change and not attach it to anything. I don't use climate change or global warming. I talk about how much hotter it is. Um, talk about how expensive food is getting. Um, I talk about what's really happening rather than attaching it to climate change. And that same Yale study, I think it was 40 to 50 percent of the people said yes, climate change is real, but like 80 to 90 percent of the people said yes to sustainable energy. Everybody's in favor of photovoltaics. Everybody's in favor of um, clean energy, it turns out, even if they don't believe in climate change or anthropogenic climate change. So focus, you know, take a step beyond why it's happening and into that it's happening. And as far as what's the most important, I don't know. I don't know. You got to sort of feel out your airplane passenger next to you. <laughs> you know, what's their gig? Number one, we're on an airplane together. That's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Greenland started to show ice static rebound losing the mass of the ice. Yep. Greenland is, is, is relaxing upward. The crust is relaxing upward because the ice is melting. There's not as much weight pushing down on the crust. And there are earthquakes associated with it. And there are lots of, if you want to get an, a little island named after yourself, there are naming opportunities. There's new islands around the coast of Greenland, never seen before, are, are, are rising out of the ocean because the crust is elastically relaxing upward. Yes. Yeah, so there are lots of examples of people having to respond and adapt to sea level rise. There are photos out there of the pine bark needle, uh, beetle. The pine bark beetle is wiping out forests all throughout the Sierra and the Rocky Mountains. From an airplane, you can take photos and not see a single living tree because this beetle is making its way up because uh, everything's getting warmer now and it's making its way up to higher elevation. We're losing the forests of the Sierras and the Rocky Mountains because this one beetle is finding new areas to move to, whereas before they were suppressed um, because they're very temperature and rainfall dependent. There was someone in the standing, did you have a question in the very back? Someone was standing there and was raising their hand when we were talk talking about what to teach kids. Yeah.
Yeah, that's a really good, a really good point. I mean, the, the way I deliver the message paralyzes everybody. And in fact, typically they'll turn off. So we've locked the doors. <laughs> when people are faced with too much negativity, they just stop listening. And with kids, I think you have to be very careful. And I, I, you know, sort of along the lines of what I described before is you don't hit them with all the negativity of this. You focus on change and measuring the world around them. And then as you expose to them how what they've been measuring uh, changes in a way that's not sustainable, hopefully then you embed personal responsibility in that message. But, you know, I would tread lightly in terms of introducing the number of negative things that are occurring. Tread lightly in what you teach our kids in any given year. Right, you've got many grades. In each grade, introduce, you know, okay, third grade will be drought. Fourth grade will be changing water resources. Fifth grade will be sea level rise. Sixth grade will be the spread of tropical diseases. In each one, you introduce the negativity, but do it in a way that it's couched as change. Uh, and learn about change, learn about the science, read National Geographic. They're doing a great job of covering all these different aspects of climate change. Don't hit them all at once. Did that? Yeah. Yes. Um, since um, you're, you implied that global warming is going to cause a lot of food insecurity and food production decreases, and since Hawaii imports 90% of its food, wouldn't it be smart for the islands to be more self-sustaining in food production? Yes. Food production. So the governor has doubling food production as a goal by 2020. We're not going to do it, but at least we've set up these goals. And there's this whole sustainability paradigm website on the governor's webpage, which involves cutting greenhouse gas emissions, spreading sustainable energy, uh, in increasing local food production. So yeah, it's an important message. And growing your, old food, your own food has a strong Hawaiian cultural component as well. Um, but we shouldn't just stop at food. I mean, literally everything we use, wear, or buy, we should try and buy local, right? I mean, we should buy local shirts, local, local furniture, what have you, because globalization and the movement of goods around the world, that's a huge carbon footprint. Yes? So use, use food in the classroom. It's a way to bridge from negativity to positivity. You're growing something. You're actually making food. I think that's a great idea. And it's, that's an activity that kids can engage in. You know, and you keep that garden going year after year as everybody moves up through their grades. That's a really good point. Yes? Right. So what are they doing there that we can do here? So I think Lanai benefits from the turbulence of the trade winds as they come into the Lahaina Roads area. They come across the, the isthmus in Maui. The trades come down between Molokai and Maui. Um, and Lanai is the receiver of these accelerated trade winds. And those accelerated trade winds, I think, provide more water. Um, volcanoes produce CO2. And if I remember it correctly, all the CO2 produced by volcanoes in the world is less than 1%. It's a fraction of 1% of the CO2 that humans are producing. That's so fast. The disulfide from volcanoes.
And it turns out volcanic eruptions tend to cool the planet because they um, put sulfur in the air and sulfur reflects sunlight back out before it reaches uh, down to Earth's surface. If you, that brings up the topic of geoengineering, yeah, is to put aerosols or dust up in the stratosphere and her, uh, vol volcano Pinatubo did this and it cooled the planet about a half a degree C for a year and a half. All those, all those aerosols will reflect sunlight out like a bunch of little mirrors. If you want to do that anthropogenically, you need something like 21, 2,100 flights a day at a cost of $20 billion a year for centuries if you want to lower global temperature one degree C. And lowering temperature one degree C will change the monsoon, it will change the global wind patterns, and you elicit major geopolitical conflict because you know, those guys voted in favor of, of this geoengineering and changed my monsoon here in India and we're having famine as a result. So geoengineering, um, everybody loves to think that geoengineering the planet will work, uh, but there are a lot of problems that are associated with it. And actually we should, we should uh, make rules regarding geoengineering so that rogue countries don't go off to start to do it on their own. Under the United Nations, we should establish some sort of geoengineering treaty. There's another question. Yes? The most efficient way is for all of us to change how we live. That's the most efficient way. Yep, Eileen. Yeah, we used to have over 250 um, stream gauges in Hawaii. We're down to less than 50 now. So if students could adopt a stream and measure the flow in that stream, get a stream gauge or just do it with some sort of equipment that the school buys. And I think, I think students should adopt a beach and adopt a forest and just go out and start collecting observations. You know, whatever is closest to your school, adopt it and start measuring it and observing it. And after 10 years, you'll have a very interesting data set. You want to make sure that the data you're collecting is good, solid, reproducible data. So get a local scientist to help you do that. But uh, we need tons of observations because our observation infrastructure has been decimated. Because when you have tight budgets, the first thing you get rid of is a stream gauge or something that's not, you know, critically important. Question? Basically, in a nutshell, what do you like best about your job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like scuba diving. I, I have a drill, and I drill uh, fossil reefs underwater, and I look at the core samples. Enlightening people, the population, uh, sounding an alarm. Is that alarming to you? Uh, this stuff? I kind of love doing this too, yeah. It makes me feel valuable like I'm helping. Well, you are. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <clears throat>